Compliance is a profession where people work tirelessly to make the world a better place. And there are hundreds of amazing and inspiring women who have helped the field develop into what it is today. Great Women in Compliance is part of the Compliance Podcast Network. So join Mary Shirley and Lisa Fine as they talk with women in compliance who are making a difference. Welcome to the Great Women in Compliance Podcast, sponsored by Corporate Compliance Insights and hosted by Lisa Fine and Mary Shirley. We're a member of the Compliance Podcast Network, where you can find a boatload of other interesting podcasts really focused on the compliance and ethics field. We invite you to join Tom Fox and take a look at his wonderful selection. I'm Mary, and today I'm very pleased to have the Nordic Business Ethics Initiative team with me here today. I'll ask each of you to introduce yourselves. Let's start with Nina. Hi, and... uh... Thank you, Mary, so much for, for the invitation. We are so happy to, to be part of this. So uh, just as a quick quick introduce f- first from my side. So I've, I've joined the, the uh, fields of compliance 15 years ago since I graduated. And actually my very first job after the, the business school was part of the SOX compliance team at Nokia. And in a way, now 15 years back, it's it's quite funny that at that time the, the compliance meant really different things than mm. it, it it means today. Mm-hmm. Sox compliance was all about internal controls and and all of these kind of fraud scandals, and and then uh, anyway, there's still st- so much so much common, but so much different when when mm-hmm. we look at that today. But yeah, so I started with with kind of SOX and internal controls compliance, then then moved into the internal audit field, and and then from that one into the ethics and compliance management. And uh, then for the past four years, I've been entrepreneur. So I kind of uh, one day just decided that that now now it's time to move on, because maybe just if if looking at the personal side, so I always wanted to be an artist, you know, singer or actor or or mm-hmm. some something else than you know all the you know, PhD from management accounting. So, so then it was a kind of a nice solution to move from this corporate um, uh, kind of 12, 12 years at, at the corporations turn into the world of entrepreneurship. And now I've been creating my own type of a business uh, and it's still around the compliance and internal control and internal audit. Wonderful. So that's, that's basically me. <laughs> thank you, Nina. And how about you, Anna? Yes, so I also want to thank you, Mary, for for having us here on the show. It's a true privilege to 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 uh, yeah take part. I've been following you for many years, and you're such an inspiration to me. So so yeah, so happy to be here. Uh, but my name is Anna Romberg, and I have a quite similar background as Nina. And um, I, if I, if I, I should add something uh, or describe myself. Shortly, I would say that I'm I'm really an advocate for good governance and ethical mm-hmm. business practices. Uh, so during my career, uh, I've been working with multinationals and in various industries. And uh, as Nina, I've also been a consultant. And at the moment, uh, I'm part of the executive management team at the global medtech company, uh, where I am heading up the global legal ethics and compliance and governance team, uh, which also includes the internal audit function. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really a lifelong learner. Um, uh, and I, I have a PhD as, as Nina as well. And I think that's sort of uh, something that describes me pretty well, that I'm always willing to learn, to develop. And, and also as Nina, I'm, I'm originally a management accounting scholar, and then I've studied sort of law along the way and then suddenly found myself in the world of ethics and compliance and think I'm really in the right place. (laughs) Well, it's a mutual appreciation fest here, Anna. Um, I remember being very pleased for you when uh, you published a book with Michaela Alberg a while back. And so it's been wonderful to follow each of you and your success, uh, both individually, but also as a team, which is the focal point of today's quick episode. So thank you so much for all that you've done to build the compliance and ethics space, both in your core compliance capacities, but also in terms of your extracurricular uh, giving back to the community. 
So um, let's jump right into it then. Anna, what is the purpose or goal of the Nordic Business Ethics team? And do you see this changing in the future in terms of adjusting your scope and focus? Well, I mean, the Nordic Business Ethics Initiative uh, was really born from a genuine interest to give back to the community or to help organizations and businesses become more ethical. And when we started uh, discussing doing something together with Nina, one of our first goals was was really to provide data uh, Mm -hmm. or get a hold of data so we could have more fact-based discussions. I think coming from an in-house perspective, we were both a bit frustrated at how superficial the discussions were mm. and and sort of thinking that you, especially here in the Nordics or Northern Europe, you know, we think we have a great culture, we have great values and that's sort of it. Mm. Uh, so yeah, our first goal was really to provide data so we could have these discussions. And then this is, these discussions is really then the core to be a facilitator for you know, good uh, dialogues and learning within the ethics and compliance community. And I would say we are pretty happy where we are right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't, you know, we, we, I guess me and Nina, when we come together, we have these crazy ideas. So, so we'll see where that will take <laughs> us. But as of now, I think we are very happy with the engagement that we have with, with the community and with our partners. Mm-hmm. I don't know, Nina, if you have any, anything else to add. Yeah, I think uh, we have been quite successful in our goal in to really become a community where people can just share and learn and get inspired. Mm-hmm. Well, I was going to ask you, Nina, next, if you'd tell us how the idea came about um, to work together on this initiative, but it sounds like Anna's given us a good um, understanding about it. it. It really came from a need of in-house professionals to Um, and talk about data and have conversations in a more meaningful way based on empirical evidence rather than just how we're feeling at the time. And I think this was quite prescient of you because you started this well before the uh, United States government talked about the need for data analytics um, to improve and enhance our compliance program. So it seems like you are a step ahead of the curve So I wondered, Nina, if perhaps you could tell us about some of the initiatives that you work on. I know that you have hosted symposiums, you interview people, you do your benchmarking survey. Perhaps you'll give us a little bit more information about some of the work that you've done. Yeah, sure. Yeah, like Anna said, it it kind of started with the idea of the survey. And Mm. I I, I still remember the the time when we actually went, we were on an airplane with Anna, we were going to Nice to write our our thesis. And and it was just a simple idea that let's do a survey in in, in Finland and in Sweden and and Mm -hmm. ask our colleagues, you know, what's what's happening. And and, and we we actually even built the survey and and put it out. And and then we realized that, okay, maybe it's not the, maybe maybe we are a little bit biased if we just ask from our own network. So maybe Mm -hmm. we need really a more... uh, a better survey that will actually uh, serve the whole population. And, mm-hmm. and while we were doing that, then we got uh, uh, one of our old friend, uh, Helge from Norway, called us that said, said that, hey, can we include also Norway into the scope? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and the next year we got Denmark. And, and then I guess in the, in, the, in the future, we will have hopefully Island, uh, Iceland and, uh, and even Baltics in the scope. But yes, the, the, so the survey has been really the kind of, and, and is the flagship of, of our, our, what we do. So basically mm-hmm. a survey that kind of gives data for the Nordic level empo- employee perception on ethics at work. And I think while that has been a very good way to also put, uh, do, do kind of a marketing and put, uh, put us, put us in, into the map in that sense that we got a lot of tensions in the, in the media and, uh, uh, across the networks and 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 because of this then we started to have also collaboration partners so actually companies and organizations who were willing to support also financially so that we were able to also we had also some maybe resources to do more more than than just the service so then we started to also have these different um um events so we have every year i think this is i'm am i counting right is it already fourth 
fourth year that we are having the Nordic Business Ethics Day this year. So basically a day where we have a good speakers like Mary, we had the, <laughs> had the chance to have you there last year. So, mm-hmm. so that's, and it's, it's always changing a bit every year. So how we do it, but, but anyway, it's, it's kind of a one or two day seminar on, on business ethics uh, in the Nordics. And um, then we've also had this uh, podcast, ethics talk podcast, and, and maybe the, the, the kind of uh, then uh, what, what came out of the first idea of the podcast was then the Ethics Talk Live, which is now, mm-hmm. I guess, one of our main uh, main uh, things. Uh, so we do that currently together with uh, DLA Piper. So we do this always with, with a certain, certain partner uh, where basically we have a live, live stream of certain topic in there that, is, that we, we feel that is, is kind of a, supporting in our aim and in our mission and then we have always great guests and uh, great discussions and and then uh, this also ability to have have it interactive so that because if it's a live stream so people can actually have all the questions on the line and and then contribute to the discussion and and then also of course um, we publish it l- later on so anyone who wants to uh, listen to our previous ethics talk lives so they are all available yeah, was that all, Anna? Did I miss something? Yeah, maybe I could just add that, uh, you know, I think we are all so sick and tired of the pandemic, but uh, mm. and, and it's been really sad and devastating in many respects. But mm. for us, it was uh, it was actually a trigger to, to explore the virtual space before, because mm. before the pandemic, when we had the survey, we had sort of in uh, real life events where where we arranged you know events in Helsinki and Stockholm and Oslo, and then suddenly uh, the pandemic hit and we were supposed mm-hmm. to have this survey launch and this Nordic Business Ethics Day and we had all the facilities reserved and we were wondering what should we do now, mm-hmm. and then we we actually hooked up with. Um, with a partner, my speaker, who is a speaking agency, that probably was was wondering a, a little bit the same, and and they they actually then. Um, uh, yeah, have this studio that that we are able to use, and and uh, and then we explored explored this opportunity, and it's been great because even if we call ourselves the Nordic Business Ethics Initiative, mm-hmm. we have participants from all over the globe, mm-hmm. and and Nordic Business Ethics is sort of more of a thought leadership, as you would think of maybe mm-hmm. Nordic cuisine. That's a specific type of mm-hmm. food that you eat all over the globe, not only in the mm-hmm. Nordics, but it comes from here. And I think that's that's mm-hmm. a bit what we d- want to do with Nordic business ethics as well. A certain mm-hmm. set of values, a way of, way of thinking. And in our events, I mean, we obviously for data privacy reasons, we're not tracking who's online and, and, and so on, but we can see from which countries. Sure. And, and I think uh, uh, we've had from like 25 countries uh, usually in our events. So it's really, truly global. And and in our latest ethics talk, I think somebody in the chat said they were from Tanzania or Kenya or somewhere. Mm. So it's really, really, yeah, fun for us actually to to be able to reach out much broader. Yeah, I agree. And we sort of have a similar outlook here at Great Women in Compliance where part of our goal was to amplify and um, highlight the achievements of women in the field and, you know, make their voices louder. But we also want to be a knowledge sharing opportunity for all in compliance. And I think the fact that you, as well as us, are embracing that inclusivity, that anybody can belong here, even if you're not part of our name necessarily, it's still a sp- space where we welcome uh, participants from everywhere, um, every demographic. So I love that inclusivity. Uh, that you have and um, very cool to see you guys getting up and running in a studio it looks very professional uh, and it is. <laughs> yeah <laughs> a great way to um, you know adjust to, to modern life as well that you uh, pivoted during the pandemic and you saw it as an opportunity to um, expand on your offerings and to better cater to your stakeholders. So Nina, you talked about the um, the survey really being the flagship and what the uh, original initiative centered around. And I think you do a wonderful job of collecting data for benchmarking purposes in your surveys. Uh, I was wondering if each of you would please share a finding from your most recent survey that you found surprising or perhaps not very intuitive. I'll ask Anna to go first. 
Yeah. Well, I don't know if this this is fully surprising, but I <laughs> I guess the I mean what. It was actually in the first survey in 2019 and then in mm-hmm. 2020 when we repeated it. I mean, the share of employees who witness something unethical mm. or even illegal mm. and do not speak up. I think mm. all of us who works in this, this field, we know mm-hmm. speaking up is hard. Mm-hmm. But uh, in our first survey, it was 48% of those mm-hmm. that had witnessed something mm-hmm. unethical or illegal that did not speak mm-hmm. up. And that was up to 62% mm-hmm. in 2020. And, wow. and then we should remember it's employees that are working in the Nordics. So one exactly. would assume that, you know, we have a pretty good, uh, you know, um, employee rights and social mm-hmm. security and, and so on. So, mm-hmm. and, and that was also interesting that the main reason for not speaking up was actually not a fear of, of retaliation, retaliation, but it was mm-hmm. it was not that. So that's maybe mm-hmm. the little bit surprising thing. Yes. It was actually it was actually that they didn't think it was going to make a difference. Yes, like this. yeah, yeah. Doesn't matter if I speak up; nothing's going to happen. I think that's incredibly um, surprising, Anna, and it reflects, I think, um, my practice of being in countries that are traditionally. Uh, not viewed as having high corruption perception. So working in, you know, I'm from New Zealand, um, I've worked in Singapore, and what I think is unintuitive about working in those spaces is that it's actually quite difficult from an ethics perspective. Same with Canada. Um, And I, I think part of that is that people are so far removed from endemic uh, corruption, petty corruption, that they just think it's not relevant to them. I think that explains some of why it's difficult to operate in those areas. I do wonder as well if part of what we're seeing, and it would be interesting to dig a little deeper into this, is that where there are issues of, let's say, price fixing cartel conduct, a lot of the time there can be some quite concrete evidence, so it's easier to speak up on issues like that. But when you see things like maybe microaggressions of racism, prejudice, bullying, harassment in the workplace, a lot of the time those things are done in circumstances where perhaps there are very few witnesses, it's verbal only. And so people uh, have less to go on if they speak up. Um, So I think it would be interesting if there was scope uh, to do so, maybe focus groups or um, a, a more of a um, digging deeper question in the survey if it was possible to find out more about, so what is the exact nature of the uh, unlawful or unethical conduct that you're seeing to help us get a grasp as to why it is that they consider it futile? And I will say that that was going to be my contribution to this discussion, is that in almost every other benchmarking survey we see, which is typically global, there is an indicator that fear of retaliation is the number one reason for why people don't speak up. And what I find is fascinating is that when you focus on the Nordics only, um, the reason of the the fact that it's futile to do so suddenly becomes the number one reason. And I think that's really helpful information to those who are running global compliance programs that where you're probably banging on about retaliation as part of your speak up campaign In the Nordics, you probably want to pivot um, to prioritizing more the fact that we are listening. We have independent and objective investigation staff who are here to look at and review the reports that you make, Um, maybe uh, closing the loop and uh, uh, sharing more broadly and being transparent with the business about when things have gone wrong, how the company has dealt with it. Personally, I like to do a two-pronged approach and I have a communications campaign where I hit on both of those at once. And if you um, are interested in uh, hearing about that, I would invite you to take a listen to our healthcare compliance series um, where uh, at the end of each episode, I share a two-pronged approach for um, attacking both retaliation and um, belief that nothing will be done if you uh, don't speak up. So, Anna, that was a great one. Thank you. Nina, what have you got that was a little interesting or surprising from your survey results? Yeah, it's actually funny that we didn't talk with Anna beforehand, but I had the exact same same thing <laughs> here when I was thinking about <laughs> this a bit before. Mm-hmm. But but I would maybe still add in into this one that uh, 
so so when we asked that uh, uh, was your manager involved in the in the unethical conduct so mm-hmm. it was uh, over over half of the people who had uh, witnessed some kind of unethical or or mm-hmm. unlawful behavior they they considered that the manager was part of the, the issue uh, so I think that's uh, that's a quite high high number yes. and why it's it's interesting I think it's also that if we think about the managers so there is obviously some kind of an uh, interpretation gap between the intention and and then the perception so mm-hmm. I think it's always very important when we talk about our survey results to to mention that it's it's the employee perception so it's not yes. the truth and mm-hmm. and but for the companies who are for example doing this service for them it's it, themselves it's it's so useful and and important information to understand that if the people in the organizations perceive that yes my my manager's behavior is being unethical or if they perceive that you know we don't have this pickup culture so because it doesn't really matter so these are very important tips uh that 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 we need Uh, mm. to be able to to um, create the culture of of um, of compliance and uh, I think one of the maybe one of the things that I I kind of uh, relate to here is that the culture of accountability is maybe mm. sometimes missing in, in the Nordics because we have these great values and mm-hmm. the trust in people so so for us uh, many times the accountability might might be even even a little bit kind of a negative word mm-hmm. or or something that why do we need it because we mm-hmm. we have we are the most ethical right. we are the ha- most happiest people in the in the earth so so mm-hmm. you know we have everything well here so we can just smile and uh, have a happy working life Yeah, and I think maybe that um, the the fact that a manager is involved may be a clue as to why some people feel scared to speak up if the case is investigated and the manager doesn't end up terminated but suspects that you've been the one to report or maybe they know for sure that you've been the one to make the report based on the circumstances, that doesn't bode well for your long-term um, success at the company. In New Zealand, we have a term, whenever you do something stupid, we joke about calling it a CLM, which is a career-limiting move. And um, in all seriousness, it could very well be a CLM to um, to report your manager for something and yet the manager ends up uh, remaining within the company and then then you've certainly got a fear of retaliation as well as the nothing was done about it. So it's a, um, a double whammy there. So that was a really interesting question and, and answer. And we know that people are far more influenced by their direct managers than they are by executive management who are further away. So maybe there is that Um, aspect to it as well. Thank you for for sharing that. And when is the next survey going to be out? When are the next results ready? Well, we are currently planning this year's survey. Mm-hmm. We are still kind of need to need to do some details still, but but we are hoping that it it will be done uh, during this year and then launched uh, after the summer. So great in September or so, yeah. That sounds good. Well, we will look forward to taking a look at that and seeing if there are any more surprising results. I find in many respects, uh, you two working together as a duo outside of your core day-to-day jobs to further compliance knowledge and amplify the voices of others. It reminds me a lot of myself and Lisa, which is probably hugely complimenting myself and Lisa there. Um, How has working together on the Nordic Business Ethics Initiative strengthened your relationship with each other and made you better compliance professionals? Nina, let's start with you. Oh, I I love this question. I think, you know, neither of us would probably have been ever able to build something like this Mm. alone and it wouldn't Mm -hmm. be even fun to do do Mm -hmm. alone. So I think here it's definitely like one plus one is is more than two and uh, mm-hmm. and and personally I think it has been you know such a privilege to work with Anna because she has been always a role model for for me mm-hmm. even even when we were working both in the in the corporate side so she mm-hmm. was the kind of uh, le- leader in the in the Nordic ethics and compliance network who who, who was really uh, someone that that I wanted to learn from and I think mm-hmm. that every no matter what we do and what we plan whether it's an event or just a you know Sunday call I think I can always 
get inspired and, and learn something new from from Anna. So I'm I'm really happy that I can I have the privilege of working with with her because I know that many many people would definitely want to take my spot here. <laughs> <laughs> Anna, how about you? How have you viewed the the relationship and the strengths? <laughs> Well, I think Nina is embarrassing me, you know. It's, yeah. <laughs> so I don't know what, what I should say, but you're really fine, Nina. No, but it's it's really we I mean it's it's so clear for me. We, we I couldn't have done this alone either because mm. we really complement each other mm-hmm. and you know when 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 I'm dropping a ball, Nina is picking it, it up mm. and, and vice versa. So I think mm-hmm. it's and uh, yes, so it's it's quite actually fun to mm-hmm. have that kind of a relationship. Uh, and what we agreed on early on with Nina was that okay, let's uh, let's also have the difficult discussions. And if mm. something annoys us, or if we feel like, hey, you know, now I'm doing more than you, or you're doing uh, more than me, or to, mm-hmm. to just like avoid that kind of unnecessary mm-hmm. friction, I think we mm-hmm. agreed early on that okay, if something is just bothering us, let's just let's just say that outright. So. Nice. And I think that's super important when it's yes. this kind of a voluntary collaboration that you agree on that, hey, there are no difficult topics and, and mm-hmm. nothing that we shouldn't be able to say to each other. So I think that's also really enabled us to go on and, and mm-hmm. to have this understanding of that, you know, uh, yeah, we, we have different strengths and, mm-hmm. and then we complement each other in a beautiful way. So So I think for any mm-hmm. collaboration, that's super important to just be honest and agree mm-hmm. that it's it's okay to be honest as well. I love that you basically declared right at the beginning, we're going to have a culture of psychological safety. <laughs> you didn't cultivate it, it just was. Yeah. Yeah, but we actually agreed that. I think yeah. you know, we said it out right, mm-hmm. right? So yeah. We, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not yeah, assuming. Think, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it would be quite difficult to work on these matters if you didn't have that kind of a relationship yourselves. I think you could see it through the live streams if if there was some something. Some friction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's right. Um, we have some uh, photos from a photo shoot. Um, uh, uh, and I know you guys do photo shoots as well. And there's one, uh, it's Lisa's favorite photo. And it's basically us just laughing our heads off and being caught in the moment. I think you can feel the spirit of a lot of our friendship and uh, working relationship that way. And of course, the, there are always challenges with different personality types. And so having the courage to um, talk through those and believe that it won't end the relationship and or friendship is, is important. Anna, will you share with us a cultural tip that compliance officers working outside of the Nordic countries would benefit from when it comes to being a global compliance officer? That's a great question, Mary. Um I would say, uh, well, well, two th- two things, uh, and I'm I'm sort of speaking to myself as well. That two things that I find really important uh, is to be authentic mm-hmm. and and to be curious. And uh, the authenticity really comes from that. It's a really po- powerful tool mm. uh, in in demonstrating what responsible leadership actually. Is mm-hmm. and and uh, to be able to say that business ethics is complex and I don't always have the answer answers mm-hmm. and sometimes there is not a perfect answer and you know sometimes I even spe- struggle with speaking up it's, mm-hmm. it's you know can also be hard for me to intervene mm-hmm. so so I think that's something I try to practice I'm not perfect in any way but I try mm-hmm. to be mindful of that that it's important and and then the curiosity. It really comes from that. Uh, I think as human beings, it's it's easy to be judgmental and mm-hmm. thinking that uh, my perspective is the best perspective and mm. the way I'm thinking is the best, you know, the, yeah, the best way of doing things. And mm-hmm. here to be curious and also open when working with our organizations, not thinking that others are idiots, they don't understand compliance, they don't, mm-hmm. you know, allocate resources or whatnot. But to really engage in those discussions and be curious and see others' perspectives. And by that, uh, I think, you know, then our colleagues will also see our perspective. So, yeah, that's just two. Authenticity and curiosity, I would say. Lovely. Thank you. 
And Nina, I've got a different question for you. Will you share with us a piece of advice for anyone who is thinking about starting an extracurricular initiative like Nordic Business Initiative or GWIC or anything else? I think I would say here that uh, you don't have to have a re- ready-made bulletproof idea. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, God knows how many times we have calibrated our plan. <laughs> and it's like, you know, we have a great plan and next week it's something different. So and I, I think that's 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 the fun part of this that, you know, it doesn't mm-hmm. have to be so, so, so. Um, kind of um, so serious and, and it's okay to also admit that, okay, mm-hmm. let's try something else. So this didn't work out. But one thing that you really have to have and, and that that I, I don't think the things would work out if you didn't have the, the shared values and the shared aim. So I think that we have had since the day one. So we want to really do something um, in this area uh, that where we can where we can share our passion towards the, the responsible le- leadership and and these difficult ethical uh, questions uh, and topics and I think that has been present in everything that we do that it's not it's not just uh, if we think about for example the the topics that we choose whether it's the survey or whether with, whether it's the ethics talk live stream it's it's never just a kind of an easy one uh, mm-hmm. and it's never uh, just something like purely related to compliance, but there's always mm. some kind of an ethical part or or employee perception part or something. Whereas there's also that will enable these difficult discussions that that we are we want to increase here. So I think that if you share the same aim and the values, and the rest will then come, you know, along the way. And mm. uh, that's that's the best part of it. That it's it's never ready and it's never completely planned. And, and um, you'll just walk, walk along and, and then miracles will happen. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for that. Thank you both for joining me today. I really appreciate your time and everything that you've uh, done with your initiative to make it a great success and to make it a resource and knowledge sharing opportunity for others. Um, I'm just going to end off today's session with um, some food for thought regarding our uh, investigations in uh, compliance. And uh, it's from a Harvard Business Review article about how anger doesn't actually signify guilt. And um, a little bit like some of the survey results we talked about earlier, I think some of us may be surprised to hear that because when we're conducting investigations, we often, I think, take um, an interviewee who we're talking to when they're angry or um, looking annoyed with us, uh, we assume a lack of cooperation or maybe an implication of of guilt there. However, in uh, experiments, it has been found that when people felt falsely or unjustifiably accused, uh, they also were angry, uh, which perhaps isn't that surprising in and of itself. But the article concludes, not only is anger an invalid cue of guilt, it is a valid cue of innocence. So I think that's something helpful for us to keep in mind as we conduct our internal investigations and compliance and try not to be swayed too much about emotions that we're really not behind, that they they do belong to other people and we cannot make uh, assumptions about how someone else is feeling and their level of guilt. Thank you so much for joining us today, Lisa and myself. Thank you for your time. And as always, we look forward to receiving your feedback and love hearing from you. Take care for now. and We look forward to seeing you again next week. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Great Women in Compliance. We hope you'll join us in honoring the great women in the compliance field by subscribing to this podcast and leaving a review.